I am Richard Patrick. I arrived in spring, January 1968, accidentally because somebody died. I think I have to have good karma at the time. Somebody arranged that. Um, unfortunately, she, um, it was due. And so I, I came for an interview with another college president, and uh, that college president uh, put Phil Wheaton onto me, saying, this is a crazy guy from Hawaii. But at the time, I, it looked like I was an okay person because I had a pretty prestigious Ford Foundation fellowship. Okay. And in, 19, in the late 60s, all over the country, the Ford Foundation, which is a multi-billion dollar NGO, was sponsoring um, people who really was against the Vietnam War, which, which I was, to do something alternatively, because my brother went to the Viet Vietnam War and all that stuff. And I was, my father was in the military, too, so that's why I like to travel and all that stuff. But instead, there were, I, I, had, I was accepted to be a teacher on a Navajo plantation, and there was something else. Okay, I, all right, let's come back there. Let's talk first about your background. Yeah. Tell, me, tell me about your background, where you were born, uh, where you were in raised. In Hawaii. Okay, what, okay. But, right, tell me about that. Well, where were you born? My father, my father was a military guy in Hawaii during World War II. Okay. So what happens is that I left the Alice. And, and he was American. Yeah. America was American then. No, he wasn't American. He didn't get state. Hawaii didn't get statehood until 1959. So it was a territory taken over by the colonists and Americans on the mainland. Okay. okay That's no, a whole no, different no. story. Your father. Where was your father? From? Yeah. He, he was from the mainland. Okay. One of these neo-colonialists. Okay. What 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 part of the United States um, are you from? New Hampshire. He's from New Hampshire. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, he goes to Hawaii like all the other GIs. They don't know when they're going to die again, so they're always heading on the, on the local beauties. And the rest is history. Uh, do okay. I have to spell that out? What, excuse me. Do I have to spell out what happens next? No. Well, okay. And 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 your mother? She was a nurse. Okay. I'm uh, working hard and. Um, in the in in Hawaii. Yeah. And what's her background? Just just an LPN. Right. No, so, no, but I mean, but, but, but she was from where? Originally, uh, Hawaii, her family. Yeah, Hawaii. Okay. But okay. so what I do, uh, what is a key point, in, like when I used to teach a course on race and ethnicity or in sociology, I really hit immigration because I knew when my grandparents came from the Philippines as indentured servants. You know, like you see these illib illegal immigrants trying to get into Europe or, um, I mean, they weren't illegal because they had a really exploitive trade contractor that brought my grandmother, grandfather over in the twenties. Okay, so they went from the Philippines yeah. to Hawaii and and lived the whole all their lives on the plantation. So I, mm -hmm. the, the the bottom line is I have a really keen sense of inequality, and some students in my class don't like that because I'm always pushing, you know, be nice to people. Life is unfair. Make things a lot better for everybody. Kind of a, a liberal orientation because of that inequality. Even though I'm really well off, and I don't have any reason to. Uh, right. Stay and on and, and so your parents met in Hawaii. Yeah. Okay, and they married in Hawaii, and they stayed in Hawaii. Yeah, and they made everything legal. Okay, and you were raised in Hawaii. No, I left when I was six. Okay, to go where? Um, all over the mainland, and in Germany, and in French Morocco. Okay, so your father stayed in the military. Yeah, he was a lifer. Okay, and he was in what branch? Air Force. It was the Army Air Corps back in the. Okay, Army Air Corps. Okay, 30, early forties. And so you could say you were an, an Army brat. Air Force brat. Or Air Force. Brat. Real difference. Right, Real rivalry. <laughs> Air Force brat. Yeah. We okay. had better things in the, at the tea club than the Army Brats. Okay, and, and, and where did you live? Uh, well, my best formative years were in, in Germany because in Germany, when you were 15, 16, in those days, you could drink. Okay. And what do teenagers do? Okay. You, you get a car from your dad and you go out with your friends and you party right. as long as you got good grades. Right. And I discovered in high school, I'm a political scientist, and one of the things everybody have to realize in my class, and I tell this in my class, is that early on I got a real sense of Life was un unfair. My, my parents were poor. I mean, they were, I came from a loving, supportive family, but they were clueless. You know, he just did his, like, Air Force job, took orders from the, from the officers, but he also had a resentment about authority, and that's rubbed up on me. This is why, I, like, I'm anti-elitist in my course and, and the rest. Even though I, in my classes I also say, yeah, yes, we need decision makers, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, people like John Adams and Jefferson were okay. But still, I have an edge to it because of the fact that I grew up, my best years were in Germany, and I was a teenager. Where in Germany? Um, it was at a missile base. Okay. And that was actually also symbolic because I remember, this is during the Cold War, and you would hear these sirens, and you would see these missiles come out of the ground, really, literally come out of the, out of the ground by, by the people's housing, and you didn't know if this was going to be a real war between Russia and the U.S., mm -hmm. but it was like, holy shit, right. And where did you go to school during that? I went uh, a military school. People... Um, in Europe were transferred. Department of Defense School? 
Yeah, uh -huh. in East Baton, and also civilians. You know, people who, whose kids were in the, the diplomatic and corps and stuff like that, or business people, right. because that's the, was the English language, and that was cool. Because again, with my independence, I was away from my parents and their perfectionist model of what I should be a good working class kid. In fact, I, instead, I was forming my own identity. Okay. I was just seeing my daughter in San Francisco yesterday. I told Sarah, "You've got." You're keeping dark, that's my grandson, too much in a box. People have to explore, let go of the little things, right? Can parents? <laughs> okay, and, and so you graduated high school from yep. there? Yep. In Germany? Yep, and, and I flew all the way to Hawaii. Only because, and actually, my, my mother was upset because I also got a scholarship to Notre Dame. And that coming from a working class Filipino family, there are all these really good Catholics. And sincere, I was a Catholic uh, altar boy. They loved me. They, they, were, they were like priming me for the priesthood um, and all that. And the nuns liked me, what? Because I knew who had the power and who would be nice to you and who would let you off the first period to go have a free breakfast because I came from the working class, mm -hmm. right? So, duh, you would have a better breakfast than what you're getting at home. Mm -hmm. And you chose not then to the priesthood. Well, because you, you really want that. The story is, in, in high school, away from home, in a military dorm, the girls were in the top floor. Okay, so you didn't live at home then? No. Okay, you were, this is like a boarding For situation. three years, like a boarding school. So I was the president of the dorm. Bad example. So I, I was, because, you know, I'm sort of shy, and people, you know, have a yeah, hard time. Yeah, I can tell. I, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I was in the, we were on the ground floor, and the girls were on the top floor. And in Germany in the 50s, you could drink. You really could. So we'd sneak the girls out. And uh, that's how I became an ex-Catholic, uh, because a Protestant girl said, you Catholics have too much a keen sense of sin. And I, I said, you're right. Okay. It was the church or her. What can I say? Okay. All right, so what did you Sorry. do when you graduated I, high school? My, my brothers and sisters are really religious people. And I actually believe in the spiritual moment. People should be spiritual, but okay. not organized religion. Okay, and, and what did you do after high school graduation? Well, I went to the University of Hawaii. It was a real struggle because it come from working class. Uh -huh. uh, you know, it wasn't like here where we were so supportive with classes of 15 or 20. I, my intro classes were like 300, 350. Mm -hmm. You had no advisors. Take this class, kid, three times a week, mm -hmm. you know, like... Uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday morning at 8 o'clock because those were the intro courses that you had to have to move up. But I got through it because I, I hated failure. I was, you know, I'm pretty motivated. And what did you major in? Political science because I was an anti-war protester. Okay. And that discipline... Um, what well, year did you graduate high school, sorry? Um, in 62. Uh, okay. I graduated from college, 67. And by 68, I had my... Master's degree and then came teaching here on that. And, and always in political science. Yeah, but lots of other stuff because I, in actuality I'm very eclectic. I was taking interesting courses in geography and okay. comparative Asian dance. You know, so this is why I travel right. all over. The, right, and, and the, the both degrees were from the University of Hawaii. Yeah. So but, you were in Honolulu the whole time. Yeah. Okay, and then. Um, but I have, if you were on the education track, after I got here in Middletown, because of Wesleyan, I had tons of courses at Wesleyan. I had a couple of national grants, so I, I had courses at NYU and um, research grants from Yale and okay. NYU. So, well, 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 tell us how you got from finishing your master's in Hawaii. Yeah. What did you do after that? Well, we were hard as the first group cohort of teachers to start this college, because Middlesex was a branch in 66 of Manchester Community College. Right. And so it's 68, my wife and I saw the first graduating class. We, we, you know, like 13 students or right, 14 right. students. Right, right, but how did you get here from Hawaii? You fly. No, fly. no, 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 no. I mean, you, like a life path. What, what led you to like Middletown? What led you to choose to come to Connecticut from Hawaii? Like, why well, did because you uh, in the Ford Foundation, I had a, I had a fellowship for, uh, it was a Ph.D. track fellowship with Southern Illinois University. That was part of the deal. We'll accept you to the Ford Foundation thing. We want you to be a college prof and, at a community college level. And I, bu I bought all that stuff. And so I was um, at um, a community college. which It was like an internship. at um, For the Ford Foundation? Yeah. Okay. With, you know, with a mentor and practice teaching and being evaluated. And then uh, in the course of that, I came over for Christmas and somebody died, unfortunately, here. And okay, so out. you came first? As like an internship yeah. for Middlesex, no, no, to um, to uh, Southern Illinois, yeah, to Missouri, actually, St. Louis, Missouri. They have three really good colleges, Merrimack, and the other two colleges. Okay, and where did you go in St. Louis? 
There, at the community college system. There's okay, a, in the community college system. Um, so you mentioned something about a mentor. Um, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, he's totally clueless. <laughs> yeah. You know, he was a PhD with lots of money. He just got big bucks. I, I tend to be a little realistic. In retro, he was a nice guy. Um, uh, and, but uh, he was just an administrator. I was just processing us in some sort of internship. He had tens of thousands of dollars to uh, feed the old pipeline for community college teachers. That's okay. His name was Charles Hill. I remember him, too. Uh, oh, okay, so the Ford Foundation is the one that assigned you to Missouri. Yeah, there was a fellowship there. Okay, and you completed the fellowship? There. Yep. And then you went back to Hawaii? Nope. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, it was like, I started here in January 1968. In December of 1967, we came here for a, uh, Christmas, you know, Christmas time, and I had to, speak, the, the fellowship lasted only one semester. Okay. And I had to um, start looking for a job. Okay. And, uh, and I, I fell into, I just fell into this place. Phil Wheaton had heard of me. He called me from Middletown to St. Louis said, I heard about you, well, would you come up here? And to his credit, Phil Wheaton was a remarkable person who had... Who Phil Wheaton was the president of the college. first president. Uh -huh. He had run um, edu military education programs for the military overseas in all kinds of places. So he was an open-minded dude, really, not, really nice guy, you know. Because, you know, over time, as a person of color, I really have gotten very sensitive to the issue of the of inequality. And it was years before somebody, like the current head chancellor is finally Asian American. One time here, years ago, true story, I was teaching some course and some Chinese American young guy come into my class. He was dumbfounded because he had flunked out of Yukon as an accounting major. He never saw an Asian American teacher. And of course, I, you know, I motivated him and off he went. I don't know what happened. I mean, there's stories like that in which, you know, you sort of like say, you got to get your butt in gear. I say that to my grandchildren. There are losers and winners in, in life. You want to be a winner or a loser? Okay, so, so Phil Wheaton recruited you then? Yeah. Okay. He kind of eventually regretted it a little bit because I could be a little mouthy. Really? He, yeah. He said, you must have been born. One time I remember, and I, that's when I got a clue that he, I guess I, sh I always spoke. He said, you must have been born with a razor in your throat, Patrick. <laughs> I was pretty cutting. But those were the 60s. You just said all kinds of crazy things. You guys can't remember that. You got to go back to the, go to YouTube with the 1960s and people like John Lennon, the long hair and dropping out in India. That was just amazing. I mean, my kids wanted to be born in the 60s. Yeah. All right, so, so, so you got the Middlesex for, in time for the spring semester. Yeah, and I missed Woodstock. It was happening in spring of 68 because I was a young married man with a kid. I had to keep my nose clean because my students, like you, young people, I say, Patrick, we're going to go to Woodstock. Have you heard of Woodstock? Yes. <sighs> the climatic event of life. It was a mess, but all the biggies were there. What can I say? By regret. Okay. I didn't go to Woodstock. All right, but you came to because Middlesex instead. Because it's just the hill, up the road. Huh? But you came to Middlesex instead. Okay. And you started here then in January 1968. So the first graduating class. Okay. Okay, the, the first graduating class, right, because that was the end of the second year. Yeah. Okay, exactly. and what was it like when you got on campus? What? That thing, we, we were out of our high school uh, on Hunting Hill Avenue because it's just a little white house that the college had bought mm -hmm. for the administrative building. And so the classes were at night from six on and we were done by nine or ten. That was it until years later. Uh, we went to, actually for a while we had uh, classes at CVH, you know, the, the mental institution and, mm -hmm. and then eventually here. It took years of the lobbying. Right. And, and did the community college in Missouri have buildings? Did they have oh yeah, campus? it was first rate. Right. Three, three major big time deals. It's like, you know, City College of New York or San Francisco. I taught at City College of San Francisco. Right. Big time, 40,000 students. Right. Yeah. Big, right. That was in the good days. But there were lots of bucks in the 60s and 70s. And, and what was your impression when you got to a college with no buildings? That didn't matter because I had a wife and a kid and I had to have a job. Okay. All right. And um, I, 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 I always liked teaching and I, I was working on an article I got published at that time. And what do you remember about your first day on campus? What I remember. Not much, you know, because you're sort of idealistic and naive and you take things for granted. I would say over time, I've revised, in fact, even this semester, I'm reinventing and re revising my class because I was at a union meeting this morning and we were talking about regrets. So one of my regrets as a beginning teacher is that I didn't have enough teaching experience or a mentor. How I mean, old were you when you started here at Middleton? 23. Okay. Some of my students who were coming back from Vietnam older than me and seeing all kinds of crap. And here I was being an idealistic person. You know, my 
two brothers were on the line, did bad things in Vietnam. But still, these are different worlds. And I, I regret not being more empathetic. And so now I'm very empathetic. Over the years, you, you learn to become a better teacher. The first years, you, you just throw out stuff in the first years. You get a text, sort of like regurgitate. My lectures now are better than some of the textbooks. Mm -hmm. And like you, you have all kinds of historical knowledge from reading so many books that you can't put in one textbook. Right, and 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 tell me about the about your colleagues when you arrived. We were all kind of free spirited persons. No, nobody was controlling or presumptuous. It was an easy going environment of building a college. People were hired uh, for different disciplines, like um, um, Wiley Pickle for chemistry, and um, you know the math teachers. Carl Rodriguez was a good math teacher, and John Macrojanis, who whose picture I pointed out, was a good econ teacher. And so I, those were some of my chums because they were friendly. You know, I was in my 30s with my wife, and we were all young couples having babies, and life was good. We got a, had a paycheck. Right. Uh, it was demanding, but, you know, the, the salary was low compared to what you guys started at. Mm. Um, 7500 for co being a college instructor, mm. really low. So I, was, I had all kinds of part-time jobs, which helped me. I was a postman on the weekends. I was bartender. What did I do? Other kinds of things. Um, you de-iced planes. Yeah, that was when I worked for United Airlines. Yeah. You remember that story? I remember the story. I haven't flown in the winter since. <laughs> um. <coughs> yeah, right. Tell us a little bit about that, if you may. Well, you know, again, I believe there's something called um, Charles... Fr See, I took a course at the University of Hawaii. In spite of the fact that it, it is far away outlier university, I learned a lot. And I took a course in um, the history of socialism. And there's a, I remember this because this came up in a conversation. I was talking with some woman on a, on a playground just last weekend. And I was talking about my travel. And I said one of the things that intrigued me was I studied something called utopian socialism. And there was a Frenchman back in the 1800s said that the human beings in their lives should be like butterflies. Uh, it, you, fly, you kind of move to different jobs. And unfortunately, the way the economy is now, people are forced into different jobs, you know, and that's a different story. But at that time, he was an idealist about what's the human potential. So I, I've done all kinds of things. Because you asked about the airlines. I actually got a better focus on connecting the working class person. Because remember, sheltered life as a teenager, what do you know other than have a good time and rebel against your parents? Go to college, struggle through college, don't have time to reflect upon things, um, and don't even think about other kinds of social classes. But when I was a... Um, working for United Airlines after teaching here at night. I would teach here till 9 o'clock at night and then go and um, load the last flight, de-ice jets, put bags in the, in the cargo thing. Even, I was one of those dudes, you know, when you see the people with the lights, all those kinds of things. And so I, and I, I learned how to use a, a, a forklift because I never had any kind of blue, I had a blue collar uniform on when I was on, on the line. I thought that was cool because I had never been a blue collar person. But it gave me an empathy that it was actually also indicative of where I failed because they eventually told me by, I started in September, and I did it because I could get free trips to Hawaii. And at $7,000, you can't afford trips to Hawaii for, for a family of four. So I did it as a means to get to Hawaii eventually, which I did get. But after I went to Hawaii with my family in spring break, they said, you know, Patrick, you're not going to make it. You're reading the New York Times at the counter, and people want your attention. And you've been, they tell me you've been giving them, um, you know, back, I mean, pushback. So I, as a professor, I had a hard time dealing with being subservient, which they call it customer service in all the agencies. Uh, and um, tell me about um, the friendships you form on campus with your colleagues, what the spirit was, because really during those years, uh, I mean, you guys were building a college. Yeah. I mean, almost from nothing. <coughs> was there a sense of mission? Was there a sense of unity? Was there a conflict? No, I don't think there was conflict. Because in those days, uh, unlike the merger with all the overstructure, I have to say, you know, there's this idealistic thing where people, were, we, we, we talk things out, there are plans. I, eventually, the administrators would get their way anyway because that's what they are to do. They get more bucks to make these decisions, but they did it in a nice way. You didn't feel like you were being ignored, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And we, it was a small group of faculty. It's not like it is now. And, and now a lot of the faculty are online and, and we're dispersed. And, and there are these more severe union contract requirements. Before it was easygoing. More, really more easygoing and um, not as much accountability. And there's something to be said about accountability because I believe in metrics. Like I, I was just working my course this morning for 
midterm, and I, I told the students every question. I had parts A, B, and C. There's metrics to this. I don't know if you guys know about metrics in our society. Things are so calibrated. Did you do this performance skill or that performance skill? Right. And there's something to be said about it. Because implicitly, you've got, when you're grading something, there are these metrics. Right, right. Um, what were the students like back then compared cool. to Cool, oh, very cool. I mean, very easygoing because, you know, these were first generation people who had never gone to college. I was, I'm the only person from my family who ever went to college to this day. So my, I have brothers and sisters who had a relatively unsavory life. I've had all kinds of options only because early on I learned about authority. I learned to speak the lingo of uh, people with authority. And I like the lingo. And I, I could, I go to postdocs at, at Yale still regularly or any place. I can throw the lingo because I read that stuff all the time. So... Uh, in those days, it was easy going, mm. uh, in which you could just become who you who you are, and nobody imposed things, and nobody said, "Here's the here's the curriculum." You didn't have behavioral objectives. You know, speaking of my acid tongue, I remember when um, a, a faculty dean Rundle had this specialist come to the campus to teach us about behavioral objectives for courses. What's your behavioral objective? I said, "I don't want to know about your, your bo." Mm. Oh, the president wrote me a, a scathing letter and apologized to this PhD expert. Okay. Um, and I guess behavioral objectives, yeah, I just, you, he and I went through behavioral objectives last summer in updating our online class. Remember all those objectives? Yeah. And, you know, because we, do, we were doing it anyway. Yeah, you want to stimulate the students? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Why do you have to make me prove it? Right. Right. And, and, and where were your offices then when there was no campus? Or did you not have an office? We didn't have an office. You just held office hours in the classroom. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, that was another board of contention because you were, like you, I was an entrepreneur. So I was the director of, the, at that time, the local anti-property programs, um, program writing. There used to be a, what's called Office of Economic Opportunity all over the country, and it was an anti-property program of neighborhood services, um, hot lunch fruit. And so because I, I have good vocabulary, I could write really fast and well, I used to crank out reports to the federalities. Um, and I did that for a while until, the, again, Wheaton says, you gotta, you got a fisher cut bait or whatever you're doing, but mm -hmm. you can't work two jobs. Because I was free during the daytime. Mm -hmm. He expected me to uh, create the curriculum in political science, mm -hmm. which I should have done. But I didn't have enough of a background um, at the time um, to do a better program. And there really wasn't the, um, the demand of high poli-sci enrollments. So we were easy going. I taught courses in sociology. Um, Race and ethnicity, ironic sociology, because that, at that time it was like Dixon was in office and I hated politics because he was in office, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I just got away from politi uh, teaching American government for, for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to it. And, you know, I, obviously that's my real area. Okay. And I took, I took a lot of grad courses at Wesleyan for sociology because I had to mm -hmm. have the background. And, and how would you say the students differed then from now? Um, I really can't tell a uh, difference. I think teaching is a, is a connection, and I get the I can get the connection on ground or even online. You can, you can feel people's personalities. I come across very friendly, a uh, supportive, and I you know they say, I'm saying you didn't do this. Why not? Give me an explanation. Mm -hmm. You have to be what I call authentic, mm -hmm. um, and you know you're authentic, and um, some some teachers aren't. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, because as when I was a chair, I I used to have battles with teachers who weren't doing their job. You mean know, you either like teaching or go uh, work for um, Amazon or something. Right. Tell me about when the camp, when the new buildings, the new campus opened. It was, you know, it's brand new, it's cool. It's, you, have a, you have your own office for a change, yeah, mm -hmm. and your own bailiwick, and you're there, you don't have to be home with, with the wife and kids, all that stuff, you can go to your office. Right. Um, so that was good. And what year did the buildings open? I really don't remember. Uh, As a matter of fact, they were asking me, because I was there years ago when they had a, a time box, a time machine, Mm -hmm. And I was there when they were, they were burying it somewhere out there, and they said, Patrick, you're going to be here. Remember where we put it. Okay. I don't remember. <coughs> Did you <coughs> find it? <coughs> nope. <coughs> you better dig up the whole campus. I have no idea. <laughs> School, uh, the, the new campus was built in 73. Uh, in 73, okay. And yeah, there is a time too. box of all the things of that year, you know, newspaper things, articles, what the kids were into. They're going to find it 5,000 years from now and... Some yeah. anthropology. Well, it's going to be underwater. It's going to be underwater. Connecticut River is going to, Mother Nature is going to take it back. 
Uh, and so all your it. kids were raised here while you yeah. were a professor here? And, yeah. and, and was your family on campus? Did, did, no, did you... no, 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 we had our own house. No, 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 I know, but, but did they participate oh, in, yeah. in campus? All the where time, they, sure. People knew them? Yeah. As a matter of fact, my, my son and daughter took, especially my son, took courses there before he went to Berkeley and uh, Yale right. um, because it, it was deferred admission because of a competition. So, you know, he applied to Berkeley when there was like a thousand straight A students applying and getting rejected. So he had to wait a semester and took courses there. I had all kind of interesting students who took courses in Middlesex and went on. I mean, yeah, when I was a bartender one time, I remember this one tall dude says, he came up to the bar and says, Patrick. I said, who are you? I don't, you, you know, you, you look like an adult. So he was this tall guy in a uniform. I mean, now he was an officer on a nuclear submarine. And one time when I was like really mouthy, he wasn't doing his way. I said, you got to get out of here and um, join the military. And actually, he did that. He just disappeared. Well, and, and how did teaching change over the years, especially with the introduction of technology? And oh, big time. How so? I, uh, first of all, I think there's a lot more information. And I think the quality of textbooks can improve. I, I like the quality of the textbooks. Some can be very formalistic and dry. And so there's more competition in the quality of textbooks if the teacher is willing to look for information. Certainly with the internet, I download all kinds of stuff. I use YouTube thing. Uh, in my course, I'm, t I'm trying to understand the alternative, right? So I don't know if you guys know about Pepe the Frog. You know about Pepe the Frog? Pepe the Frog is this outrageous dude that was uh, the, the meme for the, the alt-right. It's, it's there by my course, he was, he's, he's this guy who like flaunts stuff and acts pretty caustic and outrageous like some of the people who are, um, what are they called, Oath Keepers? You know like that guy on the Assault of Congress with that crazy fuzzy uniform with the, okay, Pepe and Frog's got that attitude like in your face. So I can download all kinds of things and I, in the interest of um, um, th uh, you know, objectivity. Not only do I download Pepe the Frog, but I also download the peace symbol saying some people think this is the, the footprint of a chicken because, you know, the, the, the clause on, you know, the, the peace symbol of, yeah. So I have symbols in my class, but I try to always say, um, you know, what's, how would the other side see this? Mm -hmm. um, so I like that. This is why I like teaching cell. So it's, it's stipulating, for me, a good day is when I have some new ideas. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, again, at my stage in life, I'm still thinking about the stages of life, which you're asking me about, and I, you'll be there too. I get more reflective, or you want more quality of life. Mm -hmm. And you think about what you could have done better in the past. I mean, there are certainly students I remember I should have been more empathetic. Okay. And when did you retire? In 2008. In 2008. And when you look back on, on your career and at Middlesex, uh, I mean, do you take pride in it? or you? Oh, not? sure. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. I. So um, it was the best thing. I, I just lucked out. I, I, I considered myself a very fortunate person of having experiences, having the options of, um, you know, being... Yeah, I always said in my sociology class that young people kept me younger. Mm. Instead of, you know, mm. well, When you look down. at this campus, the size, the technology, these studios, these offices, compared to where it started, uh, what goes through your well, mind? Well, yeah, I like to believe in some progress. It's hard to see the progress when there's overstructuring, especially the way it's happening now in the system. I, I heard a bunch of a diatribe against the, the superstructure. Now, and I, I understand that because I, I believe in decentralization. You know, federalism is about decentralization. Let have have competing in different groupings rather than say it's got to come from top. And then, you know, what happens in federalism? I mean, um, yeah, a nationalist thing. You impose doctrines, as you well know, on, on the lower levels. And that you've got to have experimentation in all fields. I really, you know, and I talk about this in my class. Competition and resilience is what keeps the country strong. And I, I monitor that in my classes because I taught courses in comparative government. And I study what countries go down the tube, like why did Russia go down the tube? What's the shortcomings of uh, communist China? Or, um, you know, autocratic regimes like in Brazil with Bolsonaro. You, you know, there's only so much regimentation dynamic, complicated societies uh, can manage. Right, but when you look back at Middlesex mm -hmm. specifically and what it started out as and mm -hmm. what it became, what goes through your mind? I think it's evolved uh, okay, um, at, except now it's got to be too much of, I, it's so it seems, the, the colleagues have lost, uh, they've gotten so super serious, they've lost their collegiality, not a collegiality that sort of, I, you know, how, how do you say it? Esprit de corps. Thank you. Esprit de corps. That's right. Which I somehow, you know, 
a job should be somewhat some place where you spend you define your identity. You can be a good artisanal baker. I know people who dropped out of corporate America and made great bread up in Vermont. Whatever you do, it should be a nice. It should be a constructive work work environment, and administrators are there to help workers become creative and productive. And it doesn't happen enough times. All right, absolutely. Right. But it was, I would say, but the first uh, three fourths of the college career, you know, and I, I've got over 50 years there. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's a good haul for 40 years of, you know, I guess I retired full time when I was about 30 or 39th year to my run. Right. And, yeah. and, and, and who is your favorite colleague of all time? Favorite, oh, Victor, you, all that Cuban history, I, I learned, <laughs> you know, you made me crystallize it. I went to Cuba, and I, I said, do you know about Victor? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and you know, they say, yeah, right, he's, he wrote these really interesting books, he's a scholar. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, except my books aren't, I'm, I'm they're, not sure they're not allowed to read them Yeah, they're censored in Cuba because, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. because he, he does, he says a lot of bad things about Castro was a bad dude. Maybe if he has state security, they wouldn't know who I am. Yeah, no, Castro was no, no, not a bad dude, but I went to Cuba for the birds. What's yeah. that? I went to Cuba to go birding. Oh. You know, this is the world's smallest hummingbird I was in Cuba. Oh. oh Tiny little thing, and I was and great fish, and the Cuban people with the salsa is great. Mm. Yeah, they just remind me of my Filipino grandparents in Hawaii. Mm. 